Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the V2 Academy. I'm Chris Lapp and enjoy, as always, I've got Peter Prickett. How you doing, Peter? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so shortly we'll be joined by Sol Igson Hurst, who is a football coach with 10 years' experience of working in Premier League academies with the likes of Tottenham and Chelsea. Before that, we thought we'd quickly discuss the recruitment of players at grassroots level. So, have you got any advice you could give to coaches on like best practice of recruitment? Um, best practice, it depends on what you want. Yeah. And I think the problem with recruitment at grassroots level is that it can be, it's it's even looked upon as recruitment in the sense of getting the best people. Yeah. So the thing that's, and it crops up every year, May, June, July, August, you see messages on social media experienced under nines <laughs> clearly a so, contradiction in terms yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, an oxymoron that's if ever there oxymoron. was one because they just don't exist no. how can you be 8 years old and experienced what the kid well what the kid what the coach is saying they want is a player who's played and knows what they're doing because they want to win games. Yeah. And there's where I personally have a problem because I've had this at my club. I've had discussions that players have been leaving a particular team or age group and they're worried about the players that they have got coming in. And, mm. and my response is, unless you've got a full squad, if someone wants to join, they join. It doesn't matter how good they are. Yeah. Because it's a community club. How many grassroots clubs are elite? None, because they're grassroots. It's the nature of the beast. And it's for the community. It's an opportunity for children to play football. It's not an opportunity for people to go and win trophies and be the best in their age group. Because I can guarantee you that there's a team out there who's going to be better than them. Yeah. Give them a chance to play. And your worst player under eight could very easily be your best player under nine. they just got to have the chance to play. So actively recruiting the best players at grassroots level is just a dangerous and elitist attempt mm. in a, an area that isn't suited to it. So, so, what's the best ways of going about recruiting? Then should, should we go to open, open trials, or, or do you go? Or well, do I'm you... not keen on trials because mm. saying tr- having trials is straight away you're saying it's in, it's in the name. It's a yeah. trial. Are you good enough? Good enough for what? Do you need to have a basic level of playability, or it depends what age we're going up for, really. So, so. Well, again, I wouldn't say it, it matters. Mm. It's whatever age. If someone wants to play, they want to play. Yeah. And I think this is where some coaches make a mistake. And what they do is, because they've got good players, they think they're a good coach. Mm. But actually, you're a good coach if you've taken someone who's not a, a very good player or wasn't a very good player, and they become a good player. Yeah. So your job, as a grassroots coach, is to improve your players, however good they were to begin with. And actually, it's easier to improve players who aren't very good than to improve players who are, who are good, because the the gaps or the strides become harder to take the better they are. Yeah. So you want to prove you're a good coach, you're not going to prove it with trophies. You're going to prove it by improving the players that you've got, whoever walks through that door. And also by accepting the challenge and going, yeah, I can see what I can do with that guy. My aim is for him to be the best player by the end of next season.
So we're delighted to be joined on the line by Saul Isaacson Hurst. Um, how are you doing this evening, Saul? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so, um, if we do a, a mini recap of our last interview in case uh, people haven't listened to it. So, um, how did you get into the game? Did you start as a player? Or? No, I didn't really start. I did, like, a, didn't have an illustrious playing career, but I, was sort of, uh, I, was, I played a bit and then I was captain of a university team. And then um, I was sort of, a friend of mine went out to America coach out there and sort of sounded like a good, good idea Yeah, went out there for an intention was going to just do a summer but ended up staying out there for two years because I really loved it um, came back and then got a job within the Tottenham Hotspur the community scheme which was then now it's called the foundation uh, worked my way up into the academy and then um, started PDA football my coaching business in between that and then got a job at Chelsea and sort of you know gone on from there really Cool. So, um, well, yeah, as you mentioned, you've either observed or worked in academies all over the world. So, so what, do you, what are the main differences between Europe, the European style and the American style of academies? Uh, well, in America, I was working in like grassroots programs and uh, high school programs and stuff like that. But I saw a lot of good young players. Yeah. But America is an interesting place because it really is sort of, you know, uh, um, a lot of mishmash of many different coaching styles. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of, obviously, footballing cultures there. So I was fortunate enough, and I worked for a company which had sort of a similar, so I had a very, like, a Dutch-style sort of coaching philosophy, which I learned, really, from scratch. Yeah. So, you know, I was very much based around ball mastery and individual technique. Uh, and But, you know, there's lots of people doing other people doing things over there as well. So, you know, it's a massive... Massive sport over there, and lots of people doing things. I don't, I don't really know a lot about the, the the academy system out there at the moment, though. But, um, what would you say that the English academies do better than other countries? Um, what do they do better? Yeah, I don't know really. What well, in compared to depends on which countries you're talking about, hmm. really. Um, it's just you know when I came in, yeah, to academy football, I did did and still do things. I think well, people say very differently because I have a different approach to. You know, it's very unconventional. It's not English football at all because basically no. I've done. I learned much of my coaching out there, and my philosophy is based around, you know, different things. And you know, I did my FA badges, which are very good and interesting. But it's not the way I coached, and you know, that's so. I learned to coach a different way. So you know, I'm, I'm not a very typical English coach, or you know, archetypal English coach, as it were. How would you describe your coaching philosophy then? Uh, how would I describe it? Is I describe it as. No, technically based. You know, it's always about the ball, the player, and the ball. Um, my philosophy has always revolved around good ball to player ratios, getting players on the ball as much as possible, letting them go out and express themselves, supporting them and expressing themselves, making them, you know, masters of the ball. You know, technique is key for me. You know, the, you know, developing technical footballers who can get on the ball and stay on the ball, make things happen, and be creative. You know, and you know, and uh, they're, they're, they're the footballers that always the footballers that always excited me when I was younger. You know, watching you know Paul Merson and Burkamp and Gazza and Model, those players who could do Peter Beersy, my favourite player, players who can do get on the ball and and you know do something exciting. So who or what has influenced your coaching style the most? Was it just seeing these players, or was it observing other coaches' work? Um, it was common. Well, really, I mean. I was always like a playground player myself, I think. Well, I was. I grew up in, in London and, you know, I was, that's very much that sort of similar player as well, like a bit of a dribbler and get on the ball and stuff like that. So and I was technically always good. I couldn't run, so I had to be technically very good. So then when I went out to America, obviously, I learned, you know, I was taught to coach this way. I just thought that, that was a way of coaching. So I was quite fortunate, really. Hmm. And so then when <clears> I <throat> came back to England, I got a job. You know, I was very much like a skills coach, a technical coach. I got a job at Tottenham because the way I was coaching, and at the time that was when, like I said before previously, you know, they had Yal was there, and there was a skills coach there. So you know, that was they 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 were doing a really you know another unique English way of doing things in academy football. You no know, one was doing things like they were doing at the time, so that that benefited me. So and then when I was in there working with coaches like Chris Ramsey and Danny Buck and you know Ricardo, these are amazing. Amazing coaches, I learnt loads, and then fortunate enough to work with other coaches and go abroad. You know, visit clubs like Ajax and those sorts of things, and see you know other technical coaches that these they've helped form my methodology. 
I was lucky enough to, to see um, Ricardo, Ricardo Monix, um, working in Hungary. And he was at, at Fenerbahce. Uh, not Fenerbahce, yeah. Fer- Ferenc Varos. Um, yeah. And I'd always been wanting to see his style because he he's not he's not a Curva coach as in the Curva company. He actually worked with Vil Curva himself. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the sort of... That's, yeah, don't sorry to interrupt you. That's sort of like the misunderstanding, isn't it? Because... Like say he's a direct disciple, Will Cova, and it's different, you know. To say to from Cova coaching the coaching brand you know here in England, so it's very you know important and interesting, dif- you know, differentiation to make. But he's amazing. He's one the best I've ever seen. What would you say the difference is actually? Because uh, there's a perception of Cova from, from people. Some people just see it as people standing in a line performing tricks around some cones, um, but if you see the, the full session structure that's just one element out of six how does that compare to Monitz's style uh, you know what I mean I don't I'm, I can't really comment too much on Cova because I don't really know a lot about it I, I know Alf Gullestein quite well and I've seen what his work he does it's very good but it's very different to what Ricardo used to do uh, Ricardo's session is much more skill based high intensity Lots of rotation, just a big key thing about that. Lots of rotation, and uh, it's based around the small sided games, um, you know. So I kind of don't comment too much about what I don't know too much about. You know. Fair enough. Uh, you like myself, uh, a keen user of social media. Yeah. Uh, and this, most people who use social media will know that this often leads into into debates. And the biggest debate at the moment seems to be almost a civil war going on between those who believe that isolated practice has a place and those who say, no, it all has to be <coughs> match-based. Yeah. What's your opinion on this debate? Um, well, I believe there's a place for unopposed work. I believe most, you know, if you're in, if you're in a team session, yeah, most of your stuff should be opposed and... I completely agree with the idea and the rationale behind it because you get multiple outcomes, a lot more decision making, you need the chaos. But to suggest that to get to an elite level, I'm talking about becoming an elite player here, you can get to elite level without doing unopposed technical work, I just think it's, it's ridiculous. And, as, and it's really frustrating as well for me, obviously, seeing the players that have come out of the programs, you know, seeing English players, we're talking about English players who have come out of skill-based programs now, you know, regardless of some of the best in Europe, young players, and trying to say, you know, then, then people are saying from the FA, no, this, that's actually, that doesn't work. And that's, that's the most worrying thing because I just think it's an information gap, it's a misunderstanding, and these people, you know, without actually looking at the evidence which is actually in this country already, that's the most frustrating thing, and let alone the, the evidence that comes from abroad with, you know, some of the most successful academies prolific academies in the world using this sort of thing so yeah I mean I'm, I think there's a play there should be both and I think that's a problem is people are in a, either an either or camp people get this idea that it's either all in this one it's all in that one when the reality is obviously you know you've got to take bits of bits and pieces and you know mould your programme I think this is the biggest misunderstanding that those people who are standing against the isolated practices seem to be thinking that those who support isolated practice are saying just do isolated practice but actually what's being said is if you've got the time to do isolated practices then it can be beneficial but if you haven't got the time and you've got a big group yes of course play big games yeah, I mean, it's, it's common sense. And the problem is, is that really, it's the people here are just trying to promote and push their own objective. That's the reality. And, you know, people, I get trolled so much as well. People saying, oh, you just, you know, you just are trying to promote your business. And by like, people who have, you know, pictures of their book on their profile or pictures, you know, people, you know, or people, you know, parent, you know, recruitment specialists who, you know, are just pro- trying to pro- promote their own agenda. And, you know, I think it's, you know, it's worrying because, you know, you, you I just worry about the future of the young players in this in this country if we're going down the wrong that wrong sort of road. So when would you, in your program, use isolated practice? Pardon, would I? When would you use the isolated practices? When would I? It depends. So if I'm team coaching, isolated practice maybe be in, in the beginning of the sessions, 
ball mastery, warm up, 1v1. I'm a big proponent of teaching 1v1 skills, not only for developing creativity, but developing explosive movement patterns as well. So developing players' movements on both sides. Um, and then obviously, look, it's, you know, looking at players if people have a proper technical issue. So, you know, worked. for instance, a player who's just been released from a Category 1 academy recently, under 16s, because he can't strike the ball. He's too, they say he's too small and he can't st- strike the ball properly. So he's got a technical deficiency. So if that technical deficiency would have been identified earlier, and it w- was identified earlier, he should, should have done more isolated shots and had to improve his phys- physical ability to shoot the ball better on both feet. And that's the sort of thing you say, oh, look, I'm having problems, I can't pass the ball properly, I can't strike the ball with my weak foot, then you might need some isolated work on that weak foot. Now, I, I personally worked with a boy, um, he was he's under 10, and his dad came to me and said, that, can we develop his, his shot power? I'm like, well, he's under 10, um, I think there's other things to worry about, but we'll give it a go. And actually, just by filming him to have him, having a number of shots we worked out that he over rotated with his with his ball striking and it was fixed quite easily just through a little bit of video work exactly if you're working with a team have you got time within your team session to stand there and film a player taking shot after shot and correct it well no that's i mean that's obviously that's uh, one of the issues with I think in this country, or most, most many countries, that with team training, obviously, I, I, you know, with PDA football, I've got an, you know, I'm, an, I'm a one-on-one football coach, so I, the amount of calls and I've got clients from, you know, I, I have at the moment, or have had clients from the majority of academies in south, the southeast, and the same thing is always said. They say they don't do any individual technical work, they don't do any sort of individual work. It's all team based. It's all team, you know, team issues, which are either, you know, defending as a unit or attacking or possession. They don't do any individual technical work, and it really is a lot of places, not all places, not luckily, not the places I've worked. It's really left up to the individual to sort it out, sort it out themselves, or sort it to themselves. So, like you know, this summer I worked with a pro who's a first-year pro at a Premier League club, and he's come to me and he's just you know he's raw. He said you know he's he's an attacking player and he's having problems with his crossing. So the same thing. But look, I looked at his crossing technique and I just suggested look, I looked at it and said look, try follow through a little bit more, and that was it. And he like done it, and then he improved straight away. And then he, I think, like, go and work on that. And that's the dude. So I had a, I had a golf lesson, like, you know, this is last year. And the guy said, look, hold, change your hand like this a little bit. Change your where you hold the the, uh, the golf club. And he goes, right now, go and practice that. And that's it. So people, this like myth that somehow you're, uh, you're, you know, you're projecting or you're telling players how to do things. You know, you're limiting them because you're projecting your own ideas of tenacity. Is that's another myth? It's ridiculous about people who, you know, I don't know if these guys have ever worked with young players before. It's about seeing when player needs a support or issues. And, you know, lots of players have unconventional technique that works. And it's good to say, cool, do that. If a, so, for instance, if a player can't cross the ball, you say, okay, look, this is an issue. And this is a first-year pro who, you know, may not not get another pro. So you say, okay, let's have a look at your technique. Let's see if we can support you and change it. See if there's any bad habits you've picked up. And that's the reality. That's what coaching is about. You know, it's like... Uh, you know, people think this idea that you're living some sort of utopia where you just leave players alone and then they're going to turn into world-class performers. Well, they might do. Some might. But I'll tell you what, a lot need help as well. A lot need some support down the line. Isn't this whole area supposed to be a big portion of the youth modules, which are now becoming part of Level 1 and Level 2? But the youth modules, individual challenges, individual goals... So sitting and working with your players and saying, this is what you need to work on. You need to think about this in today's session. You need to think about this in today's session. Or is that not going far enough for you? Well, I, I just did the level four. I was lucky enough to just do the advanced youth module. And the technical corner, there was no technical content whatsoever. So the message was literally, just let them go and play and be creative. And I was like, well, that's fair enough. But is that it? Really, is that our... Is that the limitations of our national federation's outlook? Just letting them go and play, Do you know. You know, and, it's, uh, and it was, you know, for me, that's just, that's, you know, it's questionable. Are we doing enough there to support players? You know, do, is it should we, you know, try and does it, try and create two footed players for you know, example? And why not? If we've got players at such a young age, do we not be encouraging them to try and play and develop their weaker foot? Um, 
it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a very strange approach in my, in my eyes. Is this not a problem actually of 15 plus years ago where we were telling players or sending our players to play games and we were bemoaning their lack of technical ability and not addressing it? Is this not the same issue being repeated? So we, we've slid down a road where we were looking at technique and then we've gone actually, no, the problem is they're not creative enough and they don't play enough under pressure. Actually, we need them to play, not for them to work technically. I think the um, decision was made uh, to go down this road, what's you know, and then that's the, and they've, then they've just gone for it full halted and that's there's no sort of turning back now. So and I think you know rather than look at footballing cultures which have got been successful, when you talk, talk about cultures which you know play up per heads, they're producing more Champions League players than anyone else. You now they must be doing something right, you know. Instead, we've gone down a road, which is, you know, and I agree with it, you know, you need to let players play and be creative and do that, but it doesn't mean you can't push players. We're talking about elite development here. It doesn't mean you can't push and support and challenge. You know I mean, it's not just about a challenge, OK, look, you know, how you to about, you've got to challenge individual technique. You know, if a player, for me, if a player can't stay on the ball, and this has always been a problem with English football, look at it, you know, if a player can't get on the ball and stay on it under pressure, that is an issue. So how do you do that? Yeah, you support them, let them play three games, but also, yes, you stress them, you play 1v1s a lot, get them on the ball so they've got to stay on the ball. And people say, oh, 1v1, that's an issue because there's not enough decision-making in it. But that's, they're missing the point. The whole point is about the psychological benefits you get from it is because they can't take the easy option, they can't pass the ball, they've got to stay on it, and you've got to get technical. And this is like, just talk about trying to create playground players. This is what, you know, this is what happens in the playgrounds. And that. You get on the ball, you stay on the ball, it's about, you know, have any courage to do that and, and make something happen. I mentioned at the beginning of actually the last podcast about my personal belief is that dribbling and being comfortable on the ball is a mindset. And you don't get that mindset by passing the ball to other people. You get that mindset by taking your natural instinct as a young player, which is I want to get at him, and most young players want to do that, and enhancing that and letting them do it. And then as they get older, they can learn to pass. Because if you don't have the mindset of wanting to take people on, you can't develop it later. But you can develop a mindset of passing the ball later. Well, I mean, that's, I think passing is the easy bit. Get, staying on beating players you know, with the ball is the difficult bit. You know, that's, you know, that's why you know, you've spent so much time focused on doing that. Because you know that's and you know you look at you look at European football. They made the argument you've got two players who can just get it and move it and do the, those things. That, you know, rather than how many game changes have you got? You know, players who can get on it and beat a player and make something happen. And you look at the you know look at world football. These are the players that cost so much money. These are the Ballon d'Or players, aren't they? The ones who can get on it and stay on it and make something happen. I, I was hiring a coach or looking to hire some coaches, and I interviewed a coach. Um, and I asked him what his style was, and he said that he believed he could teach any player to receive the ball and pass it, and that's what he would coach, because how many Messies are there in the world? And I said, not enough, but Messi didn't become a Messi because he always passed it. And I think that approach will limit our ability as a nation to create game-changing players. Well, I think it's sort of caught, caught in a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, slippery you know, slope or like a bit of a, a cycle where, you know, peak players go to team trainings at any level and the coach wants to win the game. So, you know, you could level, that's, you know, you play seven aside, nine aside, and the coach, you know, it's very easy to coach a game to look pretty and be effective. Whereas the reality is, you know, to really let the players develop, you've got to give them freedom to go out there and just do what they do and make loads of mistakes in reality and lose games but then how many people are prepared to lose games at grassroots level or academy level or anything like that but, you know for the uh, benefit of long term player development that's the issue and that's, a, and that's an issue like you know so it's, there's not enough unstructured play there's not enough street football we have more some of these in our more structured environments so you've got to let players have more freedom to play and develop but still you know challenging them and you know supporting them and trying to help them fulfil their potential. You talked earlier about a perception of the isolated approach creating 
players who have prescribed and or preset moves, and yeah. that being a bit of a myth, what would you say that the actual isolated dribbling practice does give them? Uh, gives them time to stay on the ball. Gives them creates movements and feints. Um, you know, if you if you look at the, I like I did my masters in. I was lucky to do a master's education. I did, looked at 1v1 coaching and young footballers. And I looked at the top leagues in the world and what skills are used. And if you look at reality, the skills that are repeated the majority of times, there's you know, there's only six, seven or eight of them actual skills with maybe some of those variations. Lots of other different techniques, but these ones are used all the time and used effectively by, by players in the top leagues, by pros. So my argument would be, teach young players these skills so like when you teach them how they shoot you teach them how to pass you teach them these skills as well these are the players these are skills that top players are using I mean it's not saying you never say look you have to use this you just open it up it's like you're saying look here's this, like you know the uh, Pandora's box open up here's all these books of tricks try these go and experiment and then players show you stuff as well and then you show other players you share it as well so that's why I think you give it it's, it's about supporting that's, and that way it supports creativity I remember having this conversation with uh, Sue Cowley on the FA thing. She's the the, uh, F, the FA's creativity expert. She said the same thing. She said it's nonsense to think that you know that if you're teaching someone a skill, it's going to limit creativity. It's like being an art, an art in the art teacher and teaching someone how to shade or draw. You know, I'm a, I'm a you know, qualified primary school teacher. You know, don't just because I'm seeing someone had a new drawing technique, I'm not limiting their drawing, you know, ability. I'm just opening up the world, showing them something, and then they can go and express themselves and try that out. Well, on the FA courses, they talk about a toolkit, giving coaches yeah. a, a toolkit that they can draw on. And they do say that doesn't mean you have to coach, for example, the old level two. That doesn't mean you have to go and coach in this stop standstill way, but it's something to put in your toolkit. And that's surely the same thing with three different types of step over. You're putting it in the player's toolkit. Yeah, exactly. And it's like. Um Yes, it's, yeah, I mean, the main thing is for me is getting them opportunities to do in 1v1s and do that. And, you know, the ball mastery is about developing comfortability, getting players comfortable on the ball, but developing functional explosive movement patterns as well, which will then make them more explosive when they're older players. You know, you're changing the way players play and players move. That's the thing. It's like, yeah, you can leave up to nature's course, but you can actually, you know, improve a player's movement patterns by working you know with the ball mastery and the turns on the weak side and that's that's a really important element I think we shouldn't forget I don't think any coaches would disagree with the principle of putting different moves into players toolkits I think where their argument is is they would simply say why can't you do that in a game scenario yeah I mean and the, and the thing is you probably could do it in a game scenario and this is like another another uh, thing you constantly hear about. Oh, but it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. A conversation with someone else on Twitter the other day, and they said, "Oh, they wouldn't use uh, overload in an attacking situation because it's unrealistic." And I was just like, "Well, it's just, I don't know if they have ever worked with young players before. Why would you not use an overload in an attacking situation? Because you give them more shots on target, you give them more opportunities to score. You know, and the same as that. You know, it's uh, you could do it in a game, but really, are the players going to learn that skill?" Are the players going to be able to do turns, new turn on their weak side in a game? No, they're not. They're not going to be able to do that. And I think that's that's where the information comes out. These these coaches don't really understand skills coaching. They don't really understand technical coaching. They think technical coaching is a level FA level two. It's not. You know, it's proper skills coaching is about proper ball mastery and one v one development. That's a completely different thing. And unfortunately, it's foreign to most coaches in this country. Well, an important thing is the trade off understanding what you're trading off so although in an overloaded situation you are trading off some realism what you are getting are more returns and more opportunities for repetition and exactly you're talking about getting more repetition you're getting more chances to shoot in an opposed environment so you know so what they complain about but then you on the other end you know, the same people love they say oh we'll use rondos as well, how realistic is a rondo then? A four v two or five v two? It's like you know, it's you're just trying to like trying to get to grips with uh, you know double standards and seem to come out with those same people's arguments. Well, the, there's a, a very simple thing that you can say is how realistic training anyway. If exactly. We, yeah. If we're going to talk about realism, 
the only thing that is real then is actually playing a game because nothing else is realistic even a training game between two halves of your squad is not realistic because the competitive element isn't there there's nothing realistic other than a match so therefore no training is realistic and you just end up chasing your tail if you stay there. Yeah. Well, I, I, I saw another one of these guys who talk about this often. And they, and they had this soccer school somewhere in, you know, abroad. And he was playing like a 9v9 with young players. And I thought, yeah, that's realistic the game. But yeah, how beneficial is that to a player? You know, what, what outcomes are you really getting? And that's the issue. It's like people will, you know, uh, forfeit technical outcomes for apparent game decision making. They don't understand actually, you know, yeah, 2v2 or 3v3 might not be like a real game, but do you really want it like a real game for young players? Because the technical outcomes you're going to get, the physical outcomes you're going to get, are going to be so much better, and that's the trade-off you've got to make. I think it's all about context, isn't it? You're looking at someone's 9v9 session, we need to know what came before that, what's coming after it. And I think the same thing with an isolated practice. What's come before it? What has that individual player done before that that he needs to work on? It's where it all sits in the spectrum. And I find it difficult to say that there is, to, about almost any style, that there is no place for that in the spectrum because different players will have different needs. Well, it's quite interesting, like, because that's what I get, you know, I've got my online training program, mypersonalfootballcoach.com, and people absolutely hammer me on Twitter for that because they or wherever and they say oh but you know you know it's a structured environment but all I'm doing is you know supporting players who want to train by themselves this is the key they say well they'd be better off playing in a game I say yeah but the point is they're not playing in a game this is designed for players who want to train by themselves and it's like people like you know just lose all sense of you know reality of course you know any player ask any player growing up me you everyone did you spend time with the, by yourself outside with the ball yes you did you know, and you could do, you could create your own games as well. This is designed for players to make, make it, to you know, challenge players and do it. And I, I can't see, you know, why people so objectify with it. And also because you know, it gets you know, players improving it. You know, and they, it gets results. And you know, pay parents and par- players and parents tell me how good it is. And it's more, I think, it is because people, you know, are so trying to promote their own agenda that they lose sight of, you know, actually uh, reality a little bit. The key is it's as well as, not instead of. Exactly. You, uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier again about the environment. So you're obviously in the one-to-one environment. It's very technical and quite intense work. In a academy environment, what are you looking for there? Um, still, like uh, I did a session with this, these, this team from Poland the other day. Uh, who came over and a mixed mixed age mixed ability group, and uh, this, the idea was still the same, still high intensity, lots of technical outcomes. First session, I was, I was the theme was Ronaldo dribbling, so never the fact that my 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 base has always been is get get the players on the ball as much as possible. So lots of ball mastery, then lots of passing receiving too, but with you know interference and then lots of one v one challenges, two v two challenges, three v three challenges. So the intensity is always high. And that's the thing I think is a massively, massive thing for me is your tempo of your session and the intensity of the session has always got to be high and you're looking for good quality technical outcomes. And, you know, that's based around, you know, 1v1s and small-sided games for me. The intensity thing is interesting because I was having a discussion with another coach and we were talking about the intensity and the tempo needs to be higher. And I am actually was going, no, it, it, it doesn't. That's not the problem. It's not the intensity. It's the intent yeah. So there is a high level of intensity and high tempo, but they were forgetting what the outcome was supposed to be. And it's the, a high level of intent to try and get the outcome that's for me, is really important. Yeah, I agree. I mean, listen, the only thing, if you've, got, I'd like one, if you've got one or two sessions with a team in a week, then the intensity has got to be high. If you're like, uh, you know, when I was, you know, if you're, if you're luxury having players a lot more, then you can afford to drop the intensity. But then, as long as that you know, is still challenging, and that's why, because you do any, you know, any unopposed work you do, that's the issue of it. It's like, like you've got to make it high intensity because it's got to be challenging. 
so I see like a lot of ball mastery practices which are just like yeah let the players go out show me your ideas and I'm thinking uh, and for me I think that's that's missing the point because you're not challenging the players you're not really stressing them and people say oh why are you stressing the player you know foundation phase 9 to 11 and this is the issue it's like people you know people talk about it being too fluffy out there and that's what the issue is like you know no it's the whole point you know you want to challenge player you know, it's got to be fun it's got to be fun players enjoy being challenged in a fun challenging environment and you test them you know and that's the key that's you know that's, that's the sort of things you've got to try and uh, try and balance for me how do you make the one-to-ones challenging how do you do it well yeah. by, by stressing the player technically stressing the player technically that's what you got to do make sure he's out of his com- out of their comfort zone his or her comfort zone and that's you know and that's that's what you got to do so you identify what the player what the player can do and you got to try and push them and see what they you know and work to their limits and, and that people you know that's the thing I'm you know for the last couple of weeks I've worked with professionals semi pros I've worked with amateurs and beginners and you know people say they don't improve from that they don't know what they're talking about because you have to you can ask these players you can see the players who've made benefits from it and, you know that's the thing that's the key is about Whatever level they are at, they will improve by spending some time on the ball, by getting that individual work and being, you know, challenged. If you see a player over a course of sessions, then do you set them targets? So this week we've done such and such a, a practice in X amount of time. Next All right, so, so for instance, tomorrow I'm working with a, with a... I've got three sessions tomorrow, right? So one of my sessions with a player who works, who's at a Category 1 Academy. I won't tell you which one because this one, this kind of doesn't do any ball mastery or one v one work. So I've got a few players from there anyway. But yeah. I, this, this the parent came to me with a particular issue. He said, to learn, "What's to improve this player's ability in one v one?" All right. So the, the sessions are revolved around that, supporting, trying to make him more dynamic, more explosive, more better in one v one. Give him a few strategies if he needs it, and try and develop those key movements. We're going to try and enhance his ability in that area. So that's quite specific. Whereas another one of my sessions tomorrow with a young player, like semi-pro player, he's a midfielder, so might be more generic. He's a bit older, so I make more generic midfielder outcomes. But you know, and that's receiving, playing the ball, both feet, turning, lots of different things. You know, so yeah, it depends. But yeah, I mean, the challenge is challenging the player, making sure you know that you're getting maximum outcomes from them, and uh, you know they're improving. All right, so it's um, time for ask the coach, and this week the question has come in from. Andrew Henderson. He's asked him, "How do you combat the difference between the rate of physical developments between children and teenagers?" Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge, you know, maturation, as, as it's as it's called. Mm. I mean, uh, if you're in a team environment, you know, you can always think about playing players, playing players down or playing players up. That's the first thing many players teams do, but that's not always the best thing. Uh, you know, you just for me, it's about recognising you know where a player is in their maturation journey and then mm-hmm. giving maybe smaller players a more of a chance an opportunity and obviously an understanding you know like bi- biological banding as well seeing where a player I work with a lot of young players and you know the first question I ask them when I meet them is when their birthday is you know to see like how far along they are compared to their to their uh, to their teammates to their peers because you know you're talking about you're talking players in foundation phase football you know nine 10 or 11 you know, players can be born in, in August or September that's a big difference mm. so you know you've got to try and recognise and then you know, in terms of the question yes yeah, about the little ones giving the little ones a bit more time maybe you know to progress you've got to see if they've got the footballing ability the technical brain the footballing brain and giving them more time challenging one for me has been with the teenagers when they hit that growth period and it affects their coordination and so a player who was technically good it gets hit by their coordination going so for a brief period it could be a year it could be a year and a half sometimes it could be two years their technique seems to have disappeared because their coordination is off because they're growing and for me I just had to stick with it because I knew that player had good technique I just had to help him through it I'm not sure if everyone is that patient or understanding probably not before people won't get that much time but you, I've seen that happen with 8 year olds and 9 year olds they get gross yeah. spurts and they, they never get recover to where they were and some players do so it's difficult you know and it's you know how, it's about I suppose you've got to give them time but how much time to give them 
Do you want to plug your social media and your websites before yeah. we go? Yeah, so you can get me on uh, my football coach on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, in my online coaching company called mypersonalfootballcoach.com. So it's an online football coaching course. We're in 20 different countries, so we're helping uh, players develop all around the world and coaches as well. And my uh, personal football coaching company is called pdafootball.co.uk. Okay, and all these links yeah. will be in the description below this podcast. Fantastic. So. So the way the way the world is now, we're all brands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone brands. I've really sp- enjoyed speaking today. I'm sure Peter has as well. So um, I'd love to have you yeah, on again so in the future. Yeah. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Cheers. Thank Sorry. you. Okay, guys. Take care. Yeah.